Welcome to Visionaries Global Media, your number one source for podcasting entertainment. Visionaries Global Media, envisioning excellence on a global scale. This is Band from Ringside. Tonight on the Band from Ringside podcast, we have your AEW Double or Nothing recap. WWE makes some releases, some shocking releases nxt moves towards their next pay-per-view and some new japan odds and ends that and a whole bunch more tonight on the band from inside podcast all right full speed ahead i was gonna say i just got to go ding on the corner ditch that nine to five it's time to feel alive hello marks and welcome to the band from inside podcast as always i'm your host bill vaggy A.K.A. Avon Smarksdale. <laughs> <laughs> Out there in Edwardsville, Illinois, we have Two Beer Zach Paul. What's going on, Two Beer? I have no idea what's going on. I um, <laughs> I feel like I'm like in some kind of weird time loop. You guys have no idea that are just now listening. Like, for the last like five minutes, all I've heard is like the intro to this play and then coughing, and then the intro would play again, and there'd be some more coughing. <laughs> So, Bill I don't know, man. <laughs> and to my right, on my back porch, in sunny oh, St. Charles, Jesus. Missouri, we have Jason Cornelius Bell. What's going on, JCB? Oh, allow us to bow our heads as we get this thing right and read from the latest edition of the Band for Ringside Podcast, Volume 208, Chapter 3, Verse 14, and the Good Smart saith, hashtag boo the heels. It is all good, baby. Listen, share, subscribe, repeat. Um... Big shout out to Chelsea for uh, the Champions League uh, win this weekend. I love. I can't wait to see Jeff Jones. I'm gonna rub that shit in his face so much. That you know how that motherfucker is. He's so fucking arrogant. And I saw Who's him. Chelsea at, is she hot? Uh, yeah, they're they're hot as fuck. They're like the uh, the kings of Europe in this case. Uh, you know how Jeff Jones is. He's so fucking arrogant sometimes. And I saw him at JP's. Are you talking about white Jeff Jones or black Jeff Jones? White Jeff Jones. Okay. So I saw him at uh, ch- uh, at JP's the, uh, a couple weeks ago. And we were talking about this game. He's like, oh, there's nothing to worry about. Man City's going to kill you guys. We got nothing to worry about. Shout out to Jeff Jones, motherfucker. You know, I'm a Man City fan, too. Well, shout out to you, too. Take that out. Not a big enough fan. (laughs) Not a big enough fan to know that that that's what happened. Uh, Like I said, we're coming at you from sunny St. Charles. Vice just pulled up just to chill, just to hang out a bit. Um, We got a bunch of stuff. It's kind of a jam-packed show. The releases of WWE any other week, WWE's... Uh, proposed or rumored deal with NJPW might have led the show, but... Um, I don't know if that was a deal or not. Well, but we can talk about it yeah. later. But anyway, uh, no sponsors. Uh, don't forget to go... Oh, I mean Bill's Beard Company. Don't forget about <laughs> Bill's Beard Company. Wait, wait! Uh, they are... There's beard oils, beard bombs, beard shampoos. No paying sponsors. Is what you're not <laughs> That's true. No paying sponsors. I haven't seen a dime from Bill's Beard Company. Beard company. No shit. That's about to say that joke is all going into pocket. <laughs> you guys see this house? This house doesn't pay for itself. <laughs> this is true. It is St. Charles. Anyway, if you need some Bill's Beard stuff, go ahead and hit me up at BFR Bill on Twitter and I will hook you up. We would do free shipping anywhere the light touches, anywhere throughout the entire globe. We will ship it to you. But without further ado, let's get to that three count. One. JCB, kick it off. As much as the WWE kind of took over the last 24 hours, we always like to go chronological around this time. So we're going to jump back to Sunday night, double or nothing from Daly's Place. I would assume this was a sellout in some form or fashion. It felt like a sellout. Um, To me, the biggest takeaway from that is the fans themselves. Um, there's certain promotions, in my opinion, that don't need fans. Like New Japan is set up to where even through the pandemic, we still had really solid matches. Fans got into it with clapping, but there was no audible cheering. WWE, to me, is kind of on the fence because if as a sports entertainment entity, I think that fans are integral in the sense that they need that feedback. You got to figure out who's over, who's not. AEW, I think, is totally, is like NXT to me. It has 
a good heartbeat, but that adrenaline from the fans makes that product that much better. And that was immediately when Adam Page came out, you felt that right away, and they kind of kept that moment. When Moxley came out, I thought this thing was going on glue. It was at the second fucking match, and motherfuckers was losing their shit. To me, the fans were the, the biggest takeaway from the Double or Nothing without question. I wasn't, I'm not a big, you know, I miss fans kind of guy. You know, I'm, I'm more of a, you know, the quality of the product. If you give me good matches, I can go without the fans. This was one of those times where immediately when Adam Page came out, I was like, damn, okay, yeah, this this makes a whole much difference to me. From that point on, obviously, the card itself, four hours is, you know, it's either you either like it or you don't. For me personally, when you're dealing with Wrestle Kingdoms in one night, that bad boy was like five or six. So for four hours for me, it wasn't even that big of a deal. I didn't even realize it was four hours until I looked up to see what time Stadium Stampede was starting. And then I started to realize it was starting to get a little late. Neither here nor there. Um, matches themselves, obviously, we could break those down. For me, the biggest takeaway from the matches, I'm sorry, Jungle Boy, to me, is the biggest takeaway. When AEW is being accused of not making stars and not being able or getting guys in, a la Mark Henry from WWE, they could have took the easy way out and just given it to Christian Cage and just set up Christian Cage and Omega at a later point down the line. Even though I would seriously doubt that Jungle Boy wins, you're getting ready to set him up to be one of those next big stars. Him and Sammy Guevara, I thought, stole the show in two different moments, somewhere in the middle for Jungle Boy, and then at the end of the uh, the show for Sammy Guevara. I thought, as as much as I disliked Sandy and Stampede, obviously, if you know me and you've listened to this podcast at any point, you know that's not my cup of tea. Sammy Guevara was the star of that show, dare I say the MVP of that match. From there, um, it, well, it looked kind of funny that all the the faces won for the most part, but yeah, that's those are my even, th- those are my three biggest about, takeaways. I didn't even think about that, Zach. What do you think of the show? Uh, it definitely had its hits and misses, uh, but I think the the hits outweighed the misses. And just to echo what uh, Jason said, like I texted you guys late one night, like whenever I finally finished the show, and I said this crowd made pro wrestling feel like the coolest thing in the world and when i'm watching it i feel like i am enjoying the coolest possible thing that could be happening at that moment right i didn't get to watch it live but if i would have i would have been like this is like the place to be this is the thing to be watching and i wish that were true for like a larger audience right like you know back in 97 98 right when we had 10 million people watching alas it's not but it's still felt great man and especially i think aw has been the hardest hit in as far as an american promotion just because like not necessarily economically or anything but like they were so hot right like before the pandemic like those crowds were like wcw nitro like 1996 like crowds like where it's just like a party atmosphere and then you go to like nothing you've got some wrestlers around and it shows that they really haven't necessarily missed a step and these young guys are still over. And I think that really is the, the story of this pay-per-view is for the most part, um, I think AW has a very bright future whenever they go on the road and we're going to get right back to that, like excitement. So I dug it, like we can go through the matches and stuff, but I, like Jason said, I think that was the overall story of the entire show. And the thing that I felt the most coming out of this is like, Maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel of this pandemic, right? It's one thing to not to walk in a grocery store and not like wear a mask. It's another thing to like have the joy of like seeing thousands of people who are into the same thing being able to enjoy and appreciate that same thing in that moment. And it was special. Man, I pretty much uh, I'll echo what you guys said. I mean, like we, like even when Brian Cage came out, he had a big smile on his face. Now we can talk. He was the first one to come out. We can talk about uh, his baby face leanings a little bit later. But to what Zach said, it was it made AEW feel like the hottest product 
with the hottest crowd. The baby faces were super over. I can only guess that there were a bunch of BFR fans there because those motherfuckers were booing the heels. Even, <laughs> even the ones, yeah. they, even the ones they liked. They were right. they booed the young shit. bucks came out and it was they on. booed the shit. And you know, every single motherfucker in that place loves the young bucks. Yeah, but they know what to do. They know what to do. They were booing the heels. Same thing with Kenny Omega. They yeah. like hated Kenny Omega. When uh, the Fuck you, Callis chant came out. That's yeah. when I was just like, okay, was, wrestling's back, baby. Yeah, it it really it really was fun. Those two matches, those two first matches were especially a fucking blast because that crowd was insane for those two matches, and it worked. It it really worked. Um, can you imagine? I, I know we'll get to it here in just a second, but like, can you imagine being Eddie fucking Kingston and coming out to that kind of a reaction? Dude's never had that in his entire career, right? It, he deserves it. He deserves it, but, yeah. It, but, you know, he, his meteoric rise has really happened in the pandemic, like, without, like, real fans. So, like, can you, I mean, like, just imagine, you know, that he's just back there in the locker room, like, getting ready for this match, smoking a Newport, you know, just like, yeah, whatever. Like, we're going to go out there. We're going to beat these bucks asses. You know, it's like, it's going to be fun, John. Like, what do you want to do? You want you want to do this? Yeah, we'll do that. And then he goes out there and it's just like, I mean, it just had to, like, be a very special oh, moment. Like, I, I I would like to hear from him. Oh, I'm sure it was, like you said, he's never played in front of a crowd like that. He's – if he's, he's never been that over, I have to assume. Like, maybe in a couple gyms somewhere. But, man, yes, he was very over. Nothing like that. They were yelling Eddie Kingston and all that stuff. It also made, made me absolutely love Moxley's – new entrance song because man it just with a with a crowd going nuts it looked like the end of major league that's what it looked like like the place was just going fucking crazy and they were walking out they had the shoes i love the promo beforehand by the bucks where they were talking they were really heavy on them taking the shoes i thought that was really funny he's like google it marks i was like "Uh oh (laughs) (laughs) Uh -oh." Uh, so let's start talking a bit let's start We'll go match by match. Uh, let's start with the the triple threat uh, heavyweight title match: Omega, Cassidy, and Pac. They made it look like Cassidy was going to win. I'll admit, uh, I knew who won before I watched it, but that crowd didn't know who won. And that crowd really thought Cassidy had it. I thought this was a great. Triple threat match. I loved it. Uh, Jason, what did you think? No, I agree totally. Um, the fact that there was a little pushback for Orange Cassidy being in this match, I think they kind of at least showed the reasons why he could have won this title. You know, if things, you know, fall fluky, you know, see Chelsea Man City this weekend. You know, Chelsea was a major underdog, so you can look at Orange Cassidy as this major underdog against the two top guys, you know, the heavyweight champion in three different uh, organizations and the number one contender, or I'm sorry, the number two contender in this scenario. You had these two guys in this match. If you'd had that as a one-on-one, that'd have been a, a, a great-ass match to begin with. But Orange Cassidy did not look lost in there. He stepped up to the plate as far as I was concerned. I'm not saying he's going to be a heavyweight champion champion anytime soon but i wouldn't be surprised if it happens somewhere down the line zach yeah uh, i love the match everybody got a chance to shine everybody got a chance to sell they're all really good at that those are just three excellent professional wrestlers so i mean like it's impossible for them to have a bad ma- match um i did love that uh, there was that moment in the match where it was like every WWE three-way like finish, right? Like, I think it was Pac hit Omega with a like big like Falcon arrow, and Cassidy hits him with the the orange punch or whatever it's called, the Superman punch, and then like goes to pin him. And that crowd thought that he was going to win the goddamn title right there. Like they were like so into it. And no, Don was, Callis, I was watching is it on live. commentary. He's like, oh shit! <laughs> he, and he's just like, shit. Yes. And he like tears off the headset and like that's when he goes down there. And I mean like it got a little wonky for me. Like it felt a little uh kind of bullet club ish because there was a lot of interference on this show. For sure. Um, but this one felt like a little extra, especially because you just ended up having Omega reverse like a pin and get like a clean win in the middle of the ring. Like I don't know I know that they were just trying to get heel heat. Um but at that point, I feel like their heel heat kind of turned into go away heat because the crowd started chanting like bullshit. 
And I wasn't like super into it either once that stuff started. Like it was funny that Omega hit him with every title belt that he had, uh, like four title belts, and he just kept tossing them away. Like it was useless after it was he hit Pack with it one time, and so he had to get another one. But at the same time, it was just a lot of, lot of fuckery. I don't think that this match needed it because it was just a kind of a a really great. I think kind of master class and, and triple threat matches. Like these guys are all phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, it was, that's what I want out of a triple threat match, right? That's why, that's why they're the Bill Vegas special because there was a lot of stuff that I, I don't even know what I'm trying to say exactly. I just, Jason, do you have the, um, the results of our picks last week? Uh, you and Two Beer were tied at 10 points. Me and Blood with Girl Raven were tied at 9. Oh, nice. 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 I can't believe Blood, Blood Girl Raven came in last, but that's what happens when you go against the pros. And I don't, I don't, I don't care if you tied with Jason. You you came in last, Blood Girl. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. Right? Oh, wow, that's fucked up. Some real heel shit. No shit. We just had a serious heel turn. Just here. to lean into it. No, we appreciate. We, of course, we appreciated. Uh, Blood Girl Raven uh, taking part in the predictions. That was a, that was a ton of fun and a good innovation by Jason as he took over last week. Yeah, every now and then, I got a good idea. Oh, uh, I think we should talk about Britt Baker. Yeah. Britt Baker and Sheeta had a great match. What you think of it, Zach? Um, I think their first match was much better. Um, I didn't love this match um, so much, but I mean. Once they got to like the last few minutes of it, it was really good. And the finish ruled. And having Tony Schiavone be like, hold on, guys, and like get out of his chair, his announcing chair, to go give like Britt a hug and like pop the audience, even though she's a total heel, but like everybody wanted to see her win the title. And even though Schiavone, like she treats Schiavone like shit, <laughs> and he still is like a little lap dog for her. I just, I think that dynamic rules. And um, so, like, afterwards, I was like very much like into it almost enough to kind of forget about some of the sloppiness in, in the match. Like, it just, they just weren't clicking at the beginning. And also kind of the way this card laid out, Cody and um, Agogo had kind of, like, killed it, like, the crowd. Um, so, um, that crowd, they were both... Uh, yeah. They were before this match, right? Yeah, was, yeah. Was, they no, were Cody yeah. and Agogo were before this match. Cody and Agogo were yeah. right after the Battle Royal. Um, yeah, the crowd needed. So, I mean, the crowd had to go down and pay, or the crowd had to be let. Down. I mean, it, it, I won't, I don't want to call it a popcorn match, but that was my that was that was my least favorite match of the night was Cody and Cody Go-Go. and Go Go. Yeah, yeah, easily, easily. I mean, one hundred percent. It was like I think kind of unanimously the worst match on the entire card, uh, which we, we'll talk about here in a second. But um, but yeah, I mean, right person won. I'm excited. Uh, for her, I saw I love the Instagram post of her and uh, Adam Cole Bay Bay. Uh, she's got the AEW, the new diamond encrusted AEW women's belt. Uh, so yeah, good for. Her. I'll go on the flip side of it, man. I'll, I'm thinking about Sheeta on this one. You know, granted, it was a a year long reign. She won in last year's Double or Nothing, so that that was kind of one of the uh, the storylines going in. Could she go wired or wire or whatever? Bailey to me, and I, I'm just going to flip it to WWE for 30 seconds, so just bear with me. D- Bailey and WWE was more of an established yeah, name, so that way when she carried the title through the pandemic, she felt she was already over. So this just you know kind of gives her a little more credibility. It's something that you know she can have on her Hall of Fame plaque whenever she goes into the Hall of Fame or whatever the case may be. She, I think, is going to be one of those that needs the fans to come back and then have a match against Britt Baker rematch to kind of get her back into the spotlight. Not unless you watched AEW faithfully, you really don't know who Sheeta is and how good she is. To me, that was the, the takeaway from that match. I was happy for Britt Baker. To me, it was kind of like, I wouldn't say obvious that she was going to win, but it felt like this was the time to do it. But the takeaway for me, and the fans kind of chanted it after the match, was thank you, Sheeta. I mean, after 360-some-odd days of being the champion, this is how it goes out. It just kind of felt like, you know, damn, Sheeta, you know, I felt bad for it. Yeah, but Britt Baker's undeniable. 
Look, she's a star. I said it. I said it last week. I said I said it two weeks ago. She was. This was the time to do it. If you didn't do it, there was a problem. Now, from this point, you got she didn't chase mode, which is probably better anyway. You'll have fans behind her. You have Nala Rose somewhere working, waiting in the lurch. Thunder Rose is on deck. So you got options with Britt Baker. The bad part about she, like I said, her title reign was in a pandemic where you didn't have fans. I guarantee you, if you have fans throughout that 300-some-odd day reign, people look at Sheeta a lot differently. I, I, agree, I agree with that. Um, moving on, there's a lot of stuff we got to get to. Uh, let's just go to Cody and a go-go. It was a different kind of match. A go-go is a, a unique wrestler, I'll say, because it, it's a lot of punches. I mean, there's a lot of uppercuts, and he's got that body punch, which I appreciate him trying to do something different or i appreciate them trying to do something the frog splash i thought was his best moment yeah they're trying to do something kind of unique with him and cody was selling for him again i don't know why you make this match i don't know why you just don't have cody go over qt marshall because if a go goes a young guy that you really want to build up i mean qt is a qt marshall is an old guy that you know let's let's just you know he's 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 not the star. He's he's not going to be a star. He's going to be enhancement talent. He really is there just because he's Cody's buddy. So why not just have Cody go over him? That being said, it was kind of a popcorn match. The crowd was on fire for those first three matches. They were on fire for Jungle Boy uh, winning the Battle Royal, too. Before we get to that, thoughts on the go-go, Cody? I definitely had picked a go-go, but in hindsight, it was a poor decision, not just because he lost, but because, I mean, he just obviously wasn't ready, right? And, I mean, like, you do that match because you want to try to elevate a guy. And when I thought back on it and seeing Cody in front of fans, like you said last week, like, on Memorial Day weekend as the American Dream with that get-up, like, the crowd was very hot for Cody whenever he was injured because he's one of their biggest stars. And it doesn't make sense for a go-go to go over one of their biggest stars. Cause then where does he go from there? Right. Does he like, uh, go to Miro or Kenny Omega? You know what I mean? Like if he's going over Cody, like that's definitely, uh, an elevation to a point that he's not ready for. Like, I mean, he has like star potential, uh, personality wise, but he's green in the ring and like, he's going to need some time. And, um, I think it's fine that he lost, uh, because now he has, you know, something to, like, work towards, right? He can get some grit, um, you know, get get upset about the loss and, and work harder, right, do the work. So, uh, yeah, in hindsight, my pick was terrible. I would piggyback on at least the pick part about it. I didn't necessarily think it was a, a very smart pick, but I do, I will push back on the fact of Cody going over. Okay, it, if Cody is not going to be the champion, and we're talking about the world heavyweight champion at this point, then what's his what's his purpose in AEW? Okay, we've TNT champion, check. Okay, from now from there, you know, what what else is he supposed to do? Okay. If he's if you're gonna have him go over, that's fine. I, I get that. It's Cody Rhodes fair, okay? You know, enter, you know, WWE joke here. But if you're going to have him go over, then have him go over in a way that still makes a go-go look strong. Okay. I mean, he sold for him. It was like 10 minutes, and he sold for him quite a bit. The finish, is, the finish is, I guess, is my biggest problem with it. Okay? It wasn't like, you know, a back, it wasn't like the Kenny Omega finish from the uh, the main event. Okay? It felt like Kenny kind of got away. You know what I'm saying? And that's, you know, it's like, oh, you know, Kenny did all this shit and he still got away. You know, you kind of got that feeling with that. That's the feeling I wanted to have with Cody. So you still have the respect, the, you know, oh, Anthony Ogogo, you know, did well in his second, you know, overall match versus, you know, now, it, to me, I look at that go now, now what you going to do? Okay, him winning probably wasn't going to happen. Cody dressed like Homelander should have made him the heel off the jump. Okay, nobody's about to say if you don't watch the boys. Okay, go watch the boys on Amazon and then go look at Cody Rose gear from Double or Nothing. He should have my fault. He should have been the heel from the jump. I look. I walked. He walked out. I'm like, 
who does he look like? That shit looks familiar. And I got on Twitter. I was like, holy shit, he look, he's fucking Homelander. I'm like, god damn, he's a heel. No fucking way he should win this shit. <laughs> From that point in, I was really rooting for Anthony to go go. I'm like, nah, dog, you dirty, man. <laughs> you just over here messing people's lives up, getting beat, bitches pregnant, all kinds of shit. No, you can't win. Um, you could have went two different ways with that. Cody winning was probably the obvious way, but on the back end of it, you got to at least make a go-go look strong, especially with the finish, because the finish was basically like, you know, I'm kind of through playing with you at this point. You know, here's the uh, the crossroads. Let's go ahead and get up out of here and get I mean, to the fans. Cody winning was obvious to, to some of us who, who picked Cody. I mean, was that <laughs> who, who picked him? Was it me and, uh, was it me and Raven? Yeah. 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 All right. All right, no, Raven, you're back in third place. Jason came in last. That was a good pick. That was the tiebreaker pick. Um, what did we? What, <laughs> right, <laughs> he's back in control again. That's why I said you got to ask the boss. <laughs> uh, what did we think about Miro versus Lance Archer? This match could have been a lot more. Um, I'm not sure what they're going for with Archer being the babyface, but. Jake the Snake coming in and trying to fuck shit up with with uh, the snake. Uh, I really, you know, as an animal lover, I don't really like Miro throwing the snake as far as he, <laughs> he threw it. He tossed the shit out that bag. I was like, God damn. Dude, <laughs> right. I love that. I mean, I've never seen that before. I've been watching Jake the Snake since I was a kid, and I've never seen anybody just, like, throw the snake. And I know there was not a real snake in there, but, like, that was a, a great spot. Uh, I like that spot. Like that kind of popped me more than anything because Miro launched that fucking thing. No, I, mean, it was, I was messing with Bo about this. It was like you know, go long and shit. You know, he was, it almost felt like he was throwing a bomb and uh, to, to somebody. You know, that wasn't even there. Um, I'm not a big fan of the, the Lance Archer kind of baby face um, turning. I guess. I guess I want to call it a baby face turn. I guess he's already a baby face. I don't know what he is at this point. The match itself, I thought was a little lackluster. Um, I expected a little more of a physical hard hit match. Not saying it wasn't. I, I expected a little more. I was really surprised at the finish where Miro puts uh Lance Archer nighty night. Um, I figured it would be a pin versus a, uh, a submission, but you kind of protect Lance Archer in this case. Well, the ref stoppage, so Same, you okay. know, no submission because he's a baby face. Yeah. Um, I think I think the announcers did a good job though of like pointing out that he had spinal surgery, so it like kind of saved him. Yeah, like be- instead of him looking like a pussy for passing out. <laughs> yeah, because, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> well, he also he also I mean he threw a bunch of kicks into his spine right before, before he it. Yeah, so it, it set it up. So I mean the, the the psychology of it. Once again, like I always say to people, there's actually in ring tell storytelling. If you actually pay attention to the shit, okay, that's the setup for the finish. I just don't know what you do with Lance Archer at this point. I mean, it's Kenny Omega is is a, some maybe somewhere down the line. He's just lost to Miro, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, the same thing never came to fruition. So I mean, it's now he's it feels like he's in that little you know purgatory of what to do with Lance Archer. And it shouldn't be that way. He's way too big, way too talented to be worried about what you should be doing with Lance Archer. All right, so. Thank you for the segue. We can go into uh, Sting in in the Make Wish match, uh-uh. which was Sting and Darby Allen who painted his whole face this time. Um, Who's, whose wish was it, Scorpio Sky? Oh, see, I, I, dude, like, see, I feel so happy for Scorpio Sky. Like, you know that he loved putting over Sting. Like, that was like, dude, like, I gotta say. This match exceeded expectations, and I'm interested to see what you guys thought of it because, like, obviously you're big. Oh, you're the sting mark. But this dude. Go ahead. Oh, dude, launching himself, like, off of the the ramp. He took a a back bump, and then he did, like, the classic sting no sell, like, you know, where he just, like, pops up, and he's, like, 62. And the Scorpio Sky does, like, the slow turn, and he throws him into his buddy, and then he jumps on both of them. Oh, man. This was, like, so much more than I expected. If I booked the match last week, and this match was so much more exciting than what I booked. I thought that it exceeded expectations also. (laughs) (laughs) As I for a dramatic pause, guys. That's some pro podcasting. Um, I thought that Sting looked... 
10 years younger than he than he ever looked in WWE. Um, and that might have been part of the hot crowd because that crowd was hot as fuck for him. The big takeaway that I took, he, listen, I, I'll admit when I'm wrong, you know, I'm not the biggest Sting guy. Darby Allen can absolutely go. I'm not the biggest fan of his character. <laughs> I came out of this. I came out of this thinking, man, this Ethan Page guy fucking rules. You know, I haven't watched a whole lot of Ethan Page. I loved him as a heel, as a cocky, uh, you know, ego, Mister Ego driven heel that he was. I was, I was a big, fa- I was a big fan of this match. I thought I liked this match a lot. No, I agree. Um, somewhere, I think the Undertaker is should be kicking something over because once again. That's the the what if match for WWE when you had them both underneath the WWE umbrella. You could have done it. Um, you cinematically, you could have done it. I don't still don't understand why they ha- didn't do it. It's going to be one of those matches that Wait, didn't, been, they, didn't, didn't they release Undertaker this week? I, uh, they, they might have. I, I haven't <laughs> looked at Twitter today, so he, I mean, did he survive the cuts? Yeah, I was going to say I haven't looked at Twitter that much good today, for, so I mean, for him. you know, too big of a contract. Look, you know, he, he's his diminishing returns might be a scenario where you know you might have to just cut bait with him at this point. Um, Sting looked good, man. All bullshit aside, he looked good. Um, I love the fact that it was Scorpio Scott that took the pin because he is a Sting guy. On the flip side of it, I hate the fact that, you know, Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky lost because now it feels like it's an Anthony Agogo kind of deal. You know, now what's next? It almost feels like Sting and Darby are going to start to get fast-tracked towards the Bucks where Ethan Page and Sky feel more of the like the legit tag team, a Bucks Ethan Sky uh, or Ethan Sky or uh, Ethan Page Scorpio Sky match doesn't sound half bad to me, but I don't think we're going to get there at this point. And I'll, to me, and they kind of said it at the end of the match, they threw out the Bucks name with Sting and Darby Allen. That's the only reason I'm even bringing this up. So I wouldn't be surprised somewhere down the line in the next couple months we see a uh, a title match with uh, Sting and Darby Allen in. Uh, what do you want to do next, Zach? What match? You want to do the opening match? Let's do the opening match. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I, I would I would rather do uh, the Bucks uh, versus Omega and and I'm sorry, the Bucks versus uh, Moxley and Kingston because it was my favorite match of the night. It was the best match of the night. I agree. I, it was my favorite match of the night. Also, Moxley. You know, you mentioned it earlier about Kingston and. He, he was clearly not just happy to be there. He wanted to he wanted to show off. And him and Moxley have kind of incredible chemistry as a as a tag team. Like they are really kind of a cool team. I wish they had a name. Um and the Young Bucks, they're better than heels. Are better as heels. And I was a, a huge fan of this match. This match was very, very very fun. Jason. The Bucks are just, they are so trollish. It is ridiculous. I've counted like at least three different, you know, WWE shots across the bow, hit targets, whatever you want to call it. I'll just say this. I know there's people that hate how the Bucks are doing this. And that's, you know, that's wrestling. That's subjective. I hate to see you jokers in the middle of the Monday Night Wars in the 90s. You don't think that both sides were firing shots at each other? I mean, it was week after week. There was a WCW promo on WWE television and vice versa, and they didn't give two shits. I don't care if the Bucks are making fun of WWE or not. They are the biggest company in the world. They're going to get shots taken at them, whether they like it or not. The fact that you're throwing at them and people are getting it and they're getting getting attention for it, you're doing you're doing what they want you to do. Okay, you are reacting to how they're making fun of Roman Reigns or making fun of Hulk Hogan or what. Whoever. Dare I say you're getting work? Ultimately, they are getting worked, okay? If you just step back and I've just, never been worked in my entire life. If you just step back and appreciate the fact that 
the art that I won't even call it artist. It's it, I would just call it for what it is. The trolling game is in full effect. The match was good to me. Watching the Bucks work the crowd, work the internet, the whole shebang. That to me was the takeaway from that match. You knew the Bucks were going to win this match. If Cody and was going to beat a go go, this is probably the next biggest lock. Okay, you knew the Bucks were going to win this match. Watching the story being told in the ring. That, to me, was the whole fucking great part of that. Yeah, because, I mean, it's a huge style clash, right? Like, yeah, you know who's going to win, uh, or you assume who's going to win, but you are very interested in seeing what's going to happen because total style clash, but what all four of these guys have in common are they are all really good professional wrestlers. Hmm. Like, that's all it takes. Styles, and, make, styles makes matches. That's what... JR always says. Now, and in this case, you got, you know, the two I would consider brawlers in Moxley and Kingston versus the two high flyers in the Bucks. And like I said, from that point, I, the only thing that I wish that they would have put a step on it so that way you could just really let Kingston and Moxley just go. Not saying that they didn't yeah. just unleash, but you could have really just let them just create havoc. Outside of that, I, I mean – the match I thought was really, really good. Go ahead, Tubir. I just love how how heelish the Bucks are. Like they are so zero unlikable. Like yes. Nick dyed his hair. Like he looks like he put like sun in, in his hair. Like, it's like gauge in his nose. I'm like, oh yeah, god one, damn! One, I know yeah, that one, 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 one of them got a septum piercing. piercing. Okay, do you know which mm-hmm. one that is? No. Jesus Christ! That's Nick. <laughs> so maybe you'll be able to tell the part. No, he still but, don't know. Uh, that's probably why they did it. They listen to the podcast. They got fuck so can't tell us apart. Like, what can I do that's so major? Like, I'm gonna get a septum piercing. Yeah, you still can't but, tell. Uh, which yeah, one, no, which one's was... got the septum piercing? Nick. Nick. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so they're just excellent. You know, and like they're they're playing like over the top like heel shit. Like they're so good at just be like like you said poking and prodding and like. You know they're pretending to be the mega powers out there, but like oh, over the top, dude. You it's know, so fucking just, funny. I'm it, sorry, it's that's so the one that made me pop. When I saw him do the the whole cold game, you know, like the <laughs> like, man, y'all motherfuckers ain't right, or dare I say, <clears throat> you ain't shit. You motherfuckers ain't exactly. shit. I mean, that's when I was like, okay, see, this is it. Something, whoever wins, see, and that's the great part about this whole. It, the whole Kenny Omega storyline, the Buck storyline, it's going to go for a little bit. Whoever beats either or should get the rub that Buddy Murphy should have gotten when he lost to Roman Reigns, but we can get to that in a little bit. Yeah, let's not jump ahead there. No, uh, it's a teaser, baby. We teaser. had uh, It's like snacks for the kids. We had Paige versus Cage. Uh, you guys can tell me which Paige and which Cage it was. But <laughs> Paige versus Cage and... Team Taz comes out and tries to throw the FTW belt to Brian Cage, and Brian Cage yells at him, I don't need you guys here, which I like that. I like uh, as a little bit of storytelling. You know, it cost him the match, but and, it, co- it cost and him. There's, there's it, the story right It cost there. him the match because he was virtuous, right? which is what a babyface should be. So, I, you know, I didn't expect Brian Cage to be the babyface coming out of Team Taz, but I do like the story they're telling. This match was great. This match was Hot as fuck, man. The whole crowd was on fire for this, like we said earlier. Uh, I like Brian Cage trying to do the buckshot lariat, even though it, <laughs> well, it, Dude, it got that, over. <laughs> no, that was that was the best part because, like, he intentionally stumbled on Done that. It. Yeah. Just, just to show, like, that's a very difficult move. Brian Cage could have done it perfectly. Oh, yeah, without question. But he, I don't doubt that in, so in a heartbeat. They're, they're, they're trading each other's finishers. And the crowd's just going wild. And then he does the buckshot lariat. But he put over Paige by showing that it's like, it's not just an over-the-top, like, clothesline. You know, it's like, this is a very difficult move to achieve. And he's like, oh, he, you know, can't I, do it. The I, fact I, that he can do it at his size is amazing. But that was, like, my favorite part of the entire match. No, I agree with that, Toey. I, I thought that was totally intentional to, to put Adam Page over even more so than that. I love the fact that after the match when – uh, Brian Cage was getting ready to walk on Ricky Starks, and Ricky Starks kind of like pointing at his neck, you know, like, you can't fuck with me, my next. That's a instant heel heat right there. So you can see once Ricky Starks comes back, 
Brian Cage, Ricky Starks. I can see that spinning off where um, Brian Cage starts his baby face turn or whatever the case may be. If it wasn't for Sammy Guevara, I mean, Brian Cage could have one of the biggest baby face turns in the company if they played it right. But Sammy Guevara is, is pretty much broken out in that without question. I mean, his we can jump to that right now, as a uh, matter of fact. Okay, let's jump to the stadium stampede. I'll let you go first. Um, you know how I feel about it. I mean, like I said, if you listen to this podcast, I'm just – I'm not going to go as far as Tinder, Mahal, and say that I'm done with cinematic matches. I think they cinematic matches have a time and a place. I just expected this to be a little something different. It wasn't different at all. It was basically the same thing. Um even with like Shao Kahn, Urban Meyer, Charlie Strong, you had your, you know, appearances or whatever the case may be. At the end of the day, I, I guess they got it right because Pinnacle won blood and guts. So Jericho and the inner circle win this stadium stampede. But I didn't see anything different. To me, it was stadium stampede too. We just changed one team and replaced it with the other. That's it. How about you, Zach? I mean, I liked the match. It was pretty long, uh, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And I love that they inserted live aspect into it, even though it was cinematic. Um, and I think the real story is Sammy Guevara, as Jason said, because not only was Sammy Guevara the one to initially leave the inner circle and cause this, this rift, uh, but then he was also the one that cost them the war games match because he submitted uh, so that MJF wouldn't throw Jericho off. So like now he gets like this whole redemption arc and he gets to do it in front of a live audience. Um, and he looks like a total badass uh, for the last like few minutes I didn't even of it. Think of that. That's, that's a very good point. I didn't even think of that. I, I thought that was like really cool storytelling, but yeah, it was a little less serious than I expected it to be, but I still enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun, uh, you know, with the fucking, the, the silliest part was, uh, there's a couple of silly parts, but we had like, uh, Sean Spears sitting in the chair room, like, <laughs> the spotlight on him. I thought that was hot, and, man. I thought that was hot. Yeah. Oh, and then the I wrestling they it. did in there, but, and then also like halfway through the match, you just have like FTR and Tully just like having drinks in a club. It's like, what I are you guys that. doing? Like, I hated that. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so There's we like attack having, having innocent drink. bystanders in the club. I mean, goddamn, <laughs> who's the guy? It was like full roadhouse. Oh yeah, I'm like, okay, so if the first group of guys get worked on, and like me, Bo, and Bill are like, you know, watching this unfold, I ain't gonna be like, oh, let's go get these guys for beating up these innocent bystanders. I'm like, man, fuck that. These motherfuckers are tripping. Let's go. <laughs> Shit, <laughs> come on. I I did. I was I was not a fan of this. I, I was a bigger fan of the first one because. It seemed kind of innovative in the way that, you know what, you, they couldn't have fans. So they had to do something different. The first one was a lot sillier, which I also appreciated. Like, them trying to put uh, serious serious aspects into this kind of missed the mark for me. I, I don't mind them trying to do something different. I don't mind the stadium stampede being, being a thing. I'm kind of with Tender Mahal. I'm done with cinematic matches. I don't think we need – we certainly don't need them if there's a crowd is the way that I feel. But then how else do you do a five-on-five? Another problem that I have with this is that Sammy Guevara goes over. All good with that. Sammy Guevara Guevara goes over Sean Spears. All good with that because Sean Spears is clearly the – you know, he's he's the least common denominator of the pinnacle – I don't understand why the pinnacle didn't go over. And the reason why the pinnacle should have gone over is because there was nobody there for Sammy Guevara to go over that would have really put him over in a major way, like like a Jericho, you know. Or if he goes over MJF, then you're killing MJF. If he right. goes over the FTR, he's killing him, uh, FTR. Warlow, same thing. There's nobody there for Sammy Guevara to go over that's really going to catapult him. I know it's a big match. I know it was the main event of a major 
and maybe this is really nitpicking now that I'm talking through it. But <laughs> you see me looking at you, right? But I stand by it. <laughs> I may be wrong. You, right? I may be wrong with the thing I just spent 30 seconds saying, but I say I stand by it. Um, no way, dude. It was, I just wish the 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 thing with Sean Spears in the chair. I guess that was supposed to look like a like a John Wick style fight or something with the chairs where uh, they they were in they were in the room full of chairs well, and they the have chairman. all these chairs. He's the chairman of AEW, so he's going to be in the no. room all the chairs. Yeah, yeah thanks. He was in his happy place. That's, there you go. <laughs> that, hadn't, that hadn't occurred to me. I'm just saying. I'll just say this. All bullshit. You know, you can roll your eyes if you want to. Thumb, thumbs down for me for the stadium stampede. And really, that's the only match that was a thumbs down for me. It kind of. Cody a go-go. Yeah, but even even that, I I wasn't expecting very much from it. I really I love the stadium stampede, the first one. I feel you know that crowd came in so hot, that crowd was so happy, and then the last thirty minutes, like Zach said, it was way too long. Uh, the last thirty minutes of their show, they have to look at the monitors. I don't know. I I thought the uh, the triple threat should have been the main event, but you know, neither here nor there. At the end of the day, like I said, I think. You're not going to get rid of cinematic matches just yet. Fans coming back is going to make it easier to have these other matches, um, especially when you have, like, step matches or whatever the case may be. But, like I said, at the end of the day, I just wanted something different, and you basically gave me the same thing. That's just not my cup of tea. It's not my bag, like uh, Austin Powers would say. So, you know, it was just a – a kind of a, it was a bad way to kind of end the uh, the pay per view. I wouldn't say bad way, just a, li- a, a little bit of a downer. A little bit of a downer. And finally, we haven't talked about Jungle Boy winning. Christian Cage puts over Jungle Boy huge, puts him over huge. Shakes his hand, hugs him, hits him in the chest, says, "Do something with this. Go make go make this worth it." This was uh, the feel good moment of the show for me. Jungle Boy is an incredible talent. He's crazy over, and he's a good baby face. And I like when you bring in a 48-year-old from WWE <laughs> and everybody expects him to win. We all pick Christian Cage, right? Yep. And everybody expects him to win. And uh, instead, he puts over the 24-year-old uh, son of Dylan Walsh, uh, which – not Dylan Walsh. I don't know. What, what was Dylan's last name? Luke Perry. Luke, I know, I know what his it name. was. It was, it was. No, Dylan you said Walsh. it again. Yeah, you said it right. I thought it was Brandon Walsh and Brenda Walsh and Dylan. Dylan oh, McKay, yeah, Dylan Br- McKay, Dylan, Dylan McKay. McKay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dylan McCocaine <laughs> addiction. <laughs> I think we just ran ball off. <laughs> but uh, a, a very cool moment, and and one that I'm sure Jungle Boy. Is very appreciative of A and will stay with him for a long time. So, do you want to say that you were wrong about Jungle Boy now? Or you want to wait? Wrong about Jungle Boy? How? That he's not. Go- you said that he wasn't going to be one of the the next big stars. That you didn't find him exciting. You didn't feel that he was going to be this big deal. MJF Jungle Boy wasn't a great match. Yeah, but MJF Jungle Boy wasn't a great match because of MJF, though. I also said that. I oh. love I love how Jason remembers these things because I forgot all about that. <laughs> oh, Jason. He's just, like, waiting. Be safe, dude. Like it's like you guys are married. And it's like, remember that thing you said four years ago about my mother? Jason, Jason's got the receipts. What do you think about it, Zach? Uh, yeah, it, it was it was great. Like, uh, it was obviously the right move, like, oh, yeah. in retrospect. And, uh it was cool to have Leo Rush as like the extra. Apparently, Leo mm. Rush is uh, signed to New Japan, uh, so he's not an AEW talent. Although that's a deal that they worked with New Japan to have him on the show. So, and apparently, uh, like, New Japan is not going to stop him from going to work for AEW or MLW. Uh, I know that MLW's final uh, episode for at least their this season or whatever they called it. Uh, Leo Rush dropped the title, the uh, middleweight title, to uh, Myron Reed. So, you know, you still have that storyline going there where they both have a win over each other. So as somebody that watches MLW, it would be nice to see that and then be able to come over to AEW and maybe challenge for the uh, the TNT title. Sorry, I didn't mean to step on your toes. Go ahead. No, that's, that's all good. Yeah, I mean, challenge Filthy Tom for that. 
uh, New Japan no open strong title. title. Yeah. I didn't even yeah. think about that. Yeah, that's that's another good point. But no, um, yeah, good good show. I mean, like uh, I think it was good, not great, uh, but at the same time, I think the crowd like almost made it transcend into greatness. No, I agree totally. Um, I love the fact that uh, post match when Christian was standing in the ring. I was sitting there, like I said, I was watching it live, and I'm like, they're not going to have Christian jump Jungle Boy, are they? I'm like, no way. You know, that's kind of messed up. So, I mean, you know, even still with the with the win, I still was, you know, watching for what was going to happen. And now it, to me, was kind of like a, an earmark of the whole show. There was always something coming around the corner. Cody Ogogo aside, like I said, I should have been smarter than that and just pick Cody because Cody's not going to lose on Memorial Day is the American dream. Stadium Stampede kind of was what it was. Either you like it or you don't. I'm just not a fan of Stadium Stampede or that kind of wrestling in general. Outside of that, I mean, this was a really good show. The fans, like you said, just gave it that little extra oomph that I think we've kind of been missing from AEW for a while. I'm excited to see where things go. I'm excited to see Full Gear come here in November. That's going to be off the fucking chain. Um, AW's back, baby. Got, and it's going to be a good rest of the year. Hopefully, fingers crossed, a good rest of the year for him. Yeah, this was this was a tremendous show. I was e- Even the stuff that I didn't like so much didn't bother me enough to turn me off of the show. Like every The highs were so high that the lows weren't nearly as low. Nope. I loved it. I agree totally. It was a good. It was a good time. It didn't feel like four hours, but like I said, at the end of the day, I think AEW's back, and I, I'm excited to see where things go from here. Overall grade, um, I'm gonna give it a B. Zach, uh, I'm gonna go B plus. Yeah, I'd say I'd say B plus. Uh, let's, no problem with the B plus. Let's get to that two count. One, two, three. Two B or what's the two count? Uh, normally, we would save this because uh, we have uh, apparently renamed odds and ends to future endeavors. Uh, but this, <laughs> we bumping this, this up. Was this was kind week. of yeah, we're bumping it up. It was kind of out of nowhere um, because apparently the last round of cuts was going to be the last round of cuts for a while, and then it obviously was not. Uh, so we had uh, some releases from WWE. I think the big one that everybody's very surprised about is Braun Strowman. Uh, but we had Braun Strowman, uh, Alistair Black, Buddy Murphy, Santana Garrett, Ruby Riot, and who else? Lana. Lana. Yes, Lana. So I don't think there was a lot of surprises for the rest of them, except for they seem to have just been doing something with Alistair Black, but that's never really stopped them before. Um, and nothing else was like a huge surprise. Uh, but yeah, Braun Strowman uh, just had too big of a contract really uh you know like more he was making more money than they wanted to give him for what he was doing which is funny because even though he's not as hot as he once was uh he definitely just had the best match that i've ever seen him in uh at that triple threat match uh i thought that match ruled and it was almost like he had like a wind of like them like not being like super behind him or whatever because he worked his ass off in that match um but to no avail uh, so it'll be interesting to see where a lot of these people go. I mean, with Braun, it was like funny because he was just making fun of indie guys during the pandemic uh, about, hey, uh, why don't you just like not be poor? And uh, then, you know, he gets cut. But he obviously wasn't a big enough star to have like a no cut clause in his contract. And I don't really see him doing anything else. Like, I don't know, like. I don't see Braun Strowman being a guy that like a Drew McIntyre that like works to improve himself to like get back to that level. I see him like, try, you know, asking exorbitant amount of money for indies to have him, and then he doesn't really work that hard. That just seems to me like the kind of vibe that I get from like Braun Strowman. But I mean, obviously, anybody's going to want Alistair Black. Uh, any company would want that dude. I think Buddy Murphy has a future and a variety of companies. Um, I think Ruby Riot also has a future because like there's women's divisions that are lacking elsewhere and she's a really good worker. Uh, 
Lana is Lana. Uh, I mean, she's not a great worker, but it's like the best work she ever did was as a manager, like sex kitten. And I know her husband's at AEW. Maybe they want to bring him, bring him on so uh, they can do a another divorce angle. Uh, I don't know, but um, the way this whole thing kind of shakes out to me, it seems like with all these cuts, because they did a bunch of office cuts and stuff too. So it seems to me like they're leaning. Uh, they're like they're cutting the fat, right? And they're they're trying to make, even though they're the most profitable they've ever been, they're trying to make themselves even more profitable. Um, so like, it seems to me like they're, they're kind of itching for a sale, right? Like you have like NBC universal who is giving them for, from Peacock alone, $200 million a year just for borrowing the content. And then NBC universal also is USA network. So they're getting $265 million a year for raw. They're the getting did like his what? research. Look at that. He knows he's got numbers and shit. Zach, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes Zach surprises you with this. Like Zach will come out with like ratings numbers and he's got contracts and shit. Okay. All right. Yeah. Like uh, they pay for NXT, you know, they they probably get, you know, something 20, $30 million a year for NXT. I think is like that range. So, I mean, if NBC universal is already paying like $500 million a year just to borrow these things, and if they don't plan on not continuing to pay that kind of money, it's like, why would why would they spend a billion over five years and then have to probably give them even more money later on when they could just, I mean, they're a huge company, like spend five billion and just own it forever, right? Like, I, you know what I mean? So like, I think maybe that's within the wind. I, I don't know. Like, I, obviously I'm not privy to that. I'm not an expert, but like for me, like why, like, buy the cow when you can just fuck it for free right sure. that's how it goes yeah th- yeah I mean, that's what jason lee says in mall rats uh jason <laughs> w- what are your thoughts on it uh, i didn't even really well i shouldn't say that obviously you know people are trying to figure out you know the why after the fact of you know the the initial shock of these cuts especially you know braun Strowman. it's i, I guess i just i'll start with braun Strowman. it's kind of funny when I think about Braun Strowman, I think about Roman Reigns and when Roman Reigns said, you ain't shit without me. I, I guess Roman Reigns was right about that. His best matches was pretty much with Roman Reigns, excluding the one we just saw with. Uh, Ooh, yeah, but remember, our, remember when we always said all roads lead to Roman? Mm-hmm. It's like Roman saying that to another wrestler is like, let me think of an appropriate metaphor here uh, it one's not coming to mind it it yeah he's not shit without roman reigns because when he's not fighting roman reigns vince knows put vince put puts no effort into him right so if roman Re- if braun Strowman ain't well, shit without that, roman reigns it's because of vince i wouldn't go that far there was that point where we thought he could have been the universal champion where we're doing the uh well, let, the pod in uh, Shock City, he, he was real hot at that point, and we thought that, you know. Around you, great balls of fire. And time. you, and you had said and it at that it. point, and you said, it, you know, you got to strike when the iron's hot. You got to strike when the iron's hot. You know, you never know when you would get this chance again. And they missed, you know, I won't say they missed the mark. They took a pass on it. And then you fast forward to How? Uh, WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. He gets the title off of Goldberg. Yeah. Womp, womp, womp. Too little, too late. Okay. And then loses it right away to The Fiend. Yeah. And then basically gets Ugh. worked over by Roman Reigns in the uh, the match after the fact. Right. Where uh, Roman Reigns ends up beating them both. So, I mean, it kind of – they. I agree with what you're saying. They set him kind of up to fail, but with, it's kind of like with Braun Strowman. There, there shouldn't have to be that much work. It shouldn't have well, to be that, that hard. That's what I was just about to say is that if you're WWE, and, I mean, there is, there's never been more of a quintessential made-for-Vince guy than, than, Braun, Braun than Braun Strowman. Agreed. He, he can work pretty good. You know, for a guy his size, I remember one time he did a kip up. I still, you know, yeah, still yeah. I, mean, I remember that. It was like on Raw. I was like, "Who the fuck you is know, this?" He's got a great look. It seems like he has a great attitude, and it seemed like he wanted to be a WWE guy for life. Zach brought up when he was kind of teasing the indie guys, which 
frankly, ain't that cool. No, not and a good look. It, it's it's not it's not gonna do him much good now. Oh unless, yeah, now you really have some shit. Unless he's going, unless he's gonna go into the indies and just be the guy that hates the indies, which I guess he could make some money do, and he'll make some money doing stuff like that if he wants to. What? But getting back to the getting back to the point. Striking while the iron, if you're WWE, how do you not make fucking millions of dollars off Braun Strowman? Like, you, you're, you're, a lot of your fan base isn't like us, you know, they're not, we're, they're not work rate people. They're not, they're not fans that are putting star, star ratings on matches. They are people that like huge guys that are specimens. Larger than life superstars. Yeah, thank you. And watching them beat the shit out of each other. And how did they not, how did they fuck up Braun Strowman? <laughs> I mean, really, like, it's pretty it's pretty amazing that Vince fucked up Braun Strowman. Uh, that and Al- Aleister Black is kind of a, a little bit of a problem with me just because they just put him back on WWE programming. And you cost Big E the, the IC title. And I said this in our text thread, and, and Zach kind of set me straight a little bit. You know, Vince don't give a fuck, and he's right. Vince don't give a fuck about that. You know, when he's done, he's done. That could have been done I don't think months what, ago. I don't think that's what Zach was saying, and we can talk about him like he's not here. I think what Zach was saying is that WWE doesn't care about the storyline. Like, if Aleister Black comes out and costs Big E the championship, but – the shareholders say you got to cut some money and it makes the most sense for them to cut Aleister Black's salary or whatever they came up with, then WWE doesn't care because they'll just keep making money despite themselves, as CM Punk said. It, it, is that pretty much what you were saying, Zach, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, they're, they're idiot proof and, like, it doesn't matter. Like, and you guys are both right. Like, yeah, Vince doesn't give a shit that he just set up the storyline because he changes shit every week anyway. Like, What's the difference whether he just changes his mind or he fires somebody? Like, it's probably going to change week to week, no matter what. You know, this way he saves some money. No, you ain't lying. Um, I really got to find that CM Punk quote the, from this week. The women, um, Lana's not a, not a major loss. I mean, God bless her. She was trying, but ultimately that wasn't going to happen. Santana Garrett is going to go somewhere and be a trainer, is my guess, and hopefully get on TV somewhere. Uh, Ruby Riot, I think, would be Impact or, I hate to say it, AEW bound. AEW probably needs her more. But I think yeah, she, or Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor would like do a murder for her. Probably. Yeah, I, I keep forgetting Ring of Honor is starting up their women's division again. Um, well, what I was going to say about Braun Strowman is basically the same thing you could say about Lana is that there's always Hollywood, like, Braun Strowman can't end up in a couple of movies. Like, Braun Strowman can't make a living as an actor. Of course he can. Doing something, you know. I mean, I don't think he'll be as good as Dave Bautista was in Blade Runner 2049 with his tiny little glasses in the very first scene. But, I mean, Braun, <laughs> Braun Strowman can – he can make money as a Hollywood guy. There's no way he can. He's probably already he's probably already fucking booked for uh Fast Fast 10, Fast 10 your seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't make that up. That's not that's not yeah, my joke. Really say, <laughs> that's not my joke. Apparently they're paid during this 90 day you know no compete clause. So I mean there's no rush for any of the women or men to go out and find, you know, money to come in. That said, it will be interesting to see where this round of talent goes. Buddy Murphy, I think, is an interesting one that we really didn't talk about too much. I think he can go. New Japan strong, please. Yeah, that was good to say. He would be a nice fit there. I would, wouldn't mind him seeing him on uh, Impact to see him in the X Division uh, uh, with title chase or whatever the case may be. Him and Josh Alexander, I think, could have some really good matches. From there, um, it would just be interesting to see because we always – the crazy part about it is we forgot about, you know, this is a second round. We forgot about, like, the Samoa Joe round. They're going to get a chance to get signed first. Yeah, we didn't even talk about Samoa Joe. I mean, you could start a pretty good – you could start a pretty good independent promotion with the guys that have been dropped by WWE in the last fucking – a couple right. months, you, you know. know I, I know everybody's going to be like, this person should go to AEW. This person should go to AEW. Well, I'm, sounds- I'm proud. I'm proud of us as a podcast 
group as a podcast that we haven't immediately just booked everybody in the AEW because that seems to be what everybody does every time somebody gets released. But, and you, honestly, if you keep doing that, then AEW is going to have the same problem that WWE is going yep. has ran into at this point where you have too many people on the roster and yeah, then you're spots. also sacrificing guys that have worked their way up in WWE or in AEW that have been doing a great job getting over there. Right. So, I mean, at a certain point, especially as long as you have the, the sharing of the talent that's non WWE related, Fuck. you can sign Leo. We just talked about Leo rush. Leo rush signed with uh new Japan, but new Japan said, Hey, you can go to a, uh, AEW, you can go to MLW. Man. You can work these other promotions. Put so in Buddy that scenario, Murphy in the G one. No, we want Buddy Murphy in the uh, best of Super Juniors. He can play replace uh, Will Ospreay. He ain't no junior. What do you think about Buddy Murphy, Zach? Oh, man, like, uh, absolute amazing talent. That's why I said New Japan is strong, just because of the travel restrictions and stuff. Um, I don't know what his situation is like, but his style is very much suited for uh, hard-hitting New Japan. Um, but, yeah, I think he would get booked in the – uh, the super junior, he's like he's very built and he's like stocky, but I think he's still that like weight class. I don't think they'd put him right in the the heavyweights. So while we're on WWE main roster, we should talk about their the rumor that got out that WWE is in talks with NJPW to make WWE NJPW sole co contributor or sole partner in uh the Western hemisphere, I guess, for lack of a better, lack of a better word. Um, this seems to be revolving around Daniel Bryan and WWE, WWF has a history with new Japan, all Japan pro wrestling going back way far. I mean, 40 years ago. Um, that being said, I don't see a way that new Japan comes out of this, any better like except financially like if, if if wwe wants to throw them a bunch of money because new japan got hurt by the pandemic quite a bit i think that's the only reason because i don't think wwe has like good good vibes and i don't think that they think that they have good intentions either you know what i mean yeah that's that's fair um i don't want to see and i don't think that they would do this i don't want to see roman reigns versus Great O'Connor or anything. Like, that's not what I'm rooting for. What I'm rooting for is guys that WWE has signed to NXT and the 205 Live, guys like, or even guys on the main roster like Ali or Dijakovic, guys like that. I'm going to see guys like that fight New Japan style. I don't know. So here's what I was thinking today, and maybe I'm completely off in this. Jason, you can answer me this question. You think if Seth Rollins, if WWE signed some sort of contract with Seth Rollins today, do you think Seth Rollins could go to Japan in a month and be able to fight a new Japan style? Or do you think that the WWE style would infiltrate it too much and kind of water it down for lack of, again, we're, we're kind of new JPW. We are new JPW dark or marks. And we want to see, when I'm watching New Japan, when I watched the Dangerous Techers versus the G.O.D. today, I didn't want to see WWE style. I wanted to see New Japan style stuff. Do you think Seth Rollins could just turn it on like that and have a New Japan style five-star classic with Shingo, <laughs> yeah. Shingo for example? The reason why I say that is because he did come from Ring of Honor, and it's not like he's a a homegrown WWE talent, okay? He knows of other things. Granted, you know, he's been in the WWE system for quite some time, so he he knows this way. But I think if you gave him the freedom to, to say, okay, Seth, we need you. We're going to place you against um, Shingo. You, will just, you said it, and we'll just stick with that. Uh, we're going to have you guys go with a 25-minute match. I don't care what you guys do, but Shingo has to go over in the end. I think you can roll the ball out and Seth can roll with the punches and wrestle a New Japan style kind of match just because he's worked an independent style wrestling, especially coming from Ring of Honor. In a while. It, to me, it, it can't it's, be that hard. To me, it's like riding a bike at that point. 
we just got to well, figure I mean, you got to figure out how you're getting there from point A to point oh, B. But we're non wrestlers. Like it, can, you think they could flip on a switch like that, Zach? I think a guy, a talent like Seth Rollins or Tyler Black, right, or a Cesaro, uh, you know, who has that now. Uh, a Randy Orton, no. A Roman Reigns, no. There you go. Even though they're they're great talents, they're very much in that kind of vibe. Because I mean, we even saw like um, you know Zack Ryder, Kurt Hawkins match on the last Impact show, and they just wrestled like a WWE match. Like it was just kind of boring. Um, they're just stuck in that mold, right? Like they're not like using the freedom that they have to like do new and exciting things. But I think those kind of, those guys are like kind of. Um, Seminal talents. Uh, those are the top two that I would think of since Daniel Bryan's not there anymore. Uh, it would be like Seth Rollins and uh, Cesaro. Those would be the, the number one guys uh, or like a Grand Metal League, right? Those are the kind of guys that I think could kind of stop Ali. on a dime. Why did you say this oh, yeah, was... Oh, yeah, stop Sorry, Tubier. Why did you say this was about Daniel Bryan? Well, I... Th- oh, because Nick, Nick Khan opened up these, according to like the dirt sheets, according uh, to like Dave Meltzer like, and the Observer newsletter. This was opened by Nick Khan, who's like you know running the company, He's like number two under Vince. And this was kind of a because Nick Khan's doing all kinds of stuff. Like he's the guy getting rid of all these office people, bringing in his own people. He's the guy that negotiated the Peacock deal. Uh, he negotiates like all of these like big money deals. And this was, I think, a way to appease Daniel Bryan and at the same time to undercut uh, the competition because. If they're the sole partnership, that really does hurt AEW. It hurts Impact and it hurts ROH because they don't have access to that, you know, kind of sublime no, talent I, roster. All bullshit aside, I mean, let's just call it for what it is. If New Japan left that coalition, for lack of a better word, not a lot of people watch Impact that I would know of, and very or even less people watch ROH. So at that point, that would be a major blow to the other side. I, I see now that you say that, I can totally see that now. And that seems to be kind of Vince's mo. I mean, he he tries to buy up all the talent so that nobody else can have it. All I all I want to say was it, Shinsuke Nak- got Nakamura is the reason why up. you don't do this. But, yeah, uh, but I mean, like Vince bought up all the TV stations. You know, and went national, like, and changed the entire wrestling game 30 years ago. Kent is the reason that you don't do this, but Nakamura, I would would think that a lot— They got that man fighting over a fake-ass crown. I would think that they—I would think that a lot of Nakamura's old Japanese cohorts, uh, match partners, look at Nakamura like he's a success story because he has been doing it for a long time. He probably makes more money. It might not be as... And he doesn't have to do much. It might not be artistically fulfilling, but he definitely is still going and still a regular part of WWE. I mean, Tazawa is not. Uh, Kenta was a big old bust. Not it wasn't not with his fault, but I mean, it, it, was, it, was, part, it was partly injuries, but... I would say... Yeah, that, and I think some of these guys have a chip on their shoulder, and Nakamura, I don't think he cares because he's in his twilight years, like... He's just like, fuck you, pay me. God, I hate that shit. Okay, I'll just say this. Then I'll go better choice of words. Okada is a reason why you don't do it. Okay? They had that Joker (coughs) looking like Kato, the impact. You don't think that, you know, they wouldn't have Shooter looking like God knows what doing. God knows. He would be running after the 24-7 title. She couldn't come over and do anything sports entertainment related. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It would but be... you know who could? Yano. <laughs> Dude, you can kiss my now, ass with that shit. Now we now we got now we got Bill booking Yano no, rain match. No, no, no. <laughs> See, we ain't gonna have none of that blasphemous talk around here, you know what I'm saying? It, for me. And when I saw this shit, I was like, you know, this is at first I, I saw it on Twitter. I was like, there's no way this is, you know, somebody's fucking trolling on Twitter. And I started to see it more and more. I'm like, OK, this, you know, this actually got a little legs to it. I'll just say this. At the end of the day, there's it doesn't make sense, like you said, for anything more than being a financial move. When it comes to, you know, the dream matches that, you know, we like to, we marks like to salivate over, 
You gonna tell me they gonna they, let, would, they wouldn't do it? Yeah, yeah you gonna tell me that they gonna let it. Okada go over Roman Reigns? Hell no! Anybody that's on the WWE side would go over. We already saw it with uh, Sting when he wrestled uh, Triple H. Triple H didn't have to go over. Okay, it's not like he had the uh, a WrestleMania, you know, win streak to protect or anything like that. They put him over to reinforce the fact that the WWE is the most dominant global wrestling organization there is. I don't want to see that with uh, New Japan just because, you know, they want to trade, you know, talent or whatever the case may be. Fuck that. WWE. King of Pro Wrestling versus the King of the Ring, Soriano <laughs> versus Baron Corbin. Oh, gross. <laughs> and I want to see Yano shave Baron Corbin's already bald head. Oh, God damn. I mean, that when you this talk, is the highlight of my experience. Now, when you talk about dream matches, I mean. <laughs> no, nah, man, don't, no, don't, don't co sign on this bullshit. That's what you're talking about. No, don't co sign on that three bullshit. Three minute chin lock into a low blow. <laughs> As long as it's fast, quick, and just pinned, and Baron Corbin gets pinned, I, that that'd be the, probably the only time I would root for Yano at that point because I, I like I, Baron Corbin is like worse than Yano in my mind, and that's saying something. Historically, though, historically they would send guys over that could lose. Um, you know, like Vince doesn't give a shit if Cesaro goes and loses at G one. You know, like that ain't a thing to him. He doesn't give a fuck about Cesaro. Like he was a little placeholder here, and he got a little push. Yeah, but, but I mean, like, okay, but historically, you're like. If they, well, historically, if you look back on it, guys go to Japan and they do lose because they don't send their top guys. Now you got your whole Kogan and stuff that refuse to do jobs, so then they end up putting Ric Flair in there because Ric Flair's like, "Yeah, I'll do a job doing Tony Inoki and like the biggest goddamn wrestling match in history." I'm like, fuck. Did you, <laughs> you know? did you watch that uh, Dark Side of the Ring episode? The North Korea one. The North Korea yeah. one. That shit's crazy. I haven't watched oh, it. Yet. It's wild. I heard it's good. Really uh, good. Uh, I. I I got it all out of the way. You guys good? Yeah. And, um, like I said, yes. I, I'll be surprised. I want to see where this next go, go around. The first go around is the Samoa Joe go around. This one is going to be even more interesting because I think, you know, Braun Strowman is the big name, but Buddy Murphy, I think, is going to be real interested to see where he goes. Uh, Buddy Murphy, Alistair Black are definitely the more interesting ones. For sure. Braun Strowman was the one. The name. That was that was the shocking one. Yeah, I had to go to WWE's Twitter page back. Like, okay, is this shit real? <laughs> yep, this shit's real. Let's get to that three counts. One, two, three. All right, so NXT Tuesday night uh, had an interesting night. Pretty good night, I guess. It's I wasn't very happy with the end of the first match, which was Kyle O'Reilly versus Pete Dunne versus Johnny Gargano to see who the number one contender was. Adam Cole, baby, makes his return and fucks it all up. I did like how they kind of made it look like Regal was losing control of the Dude, show. <laughs> I thought he was getting ready. To, his head was getting ready to explode. Jesus Christ! I mean, that's a Dude, good... Regal is the best general manager in history of all time. He's so. He looked like, he's like, I want to beat this little dude's ass so bad, right. but I'm in a yes. managerial role, and I can't put hands on him because I'll get a lawsuit. You know, like, he just looked like he wanted to fucking kill him. Like, he's the best. I was like, look, I've looked he, at my he kids came out like to yell at him up in a restaurant. He, he came out to yell at him. And, and he Ember couldn't Moon. yell at him anymore. It was just like, <laughs> like, what the fuck? And then Ember Moon walked past him. He was like, what the fuck are you doing here? What? I didn't even know. I just saw like a blur. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? Because I'm so focused on Cole and uh, Steven Regal. And next thing you know, I hear Ember Moon. I'm like, damn, Regal, you are losing all kind of control of this shit. And I'm like, this mother. And he had to come back out. I was like, dude, what the fuck? So I know this is your count, and I don't want to step on your toes, but I, I like this. I like this segment for one major reason, and it's because, as we've said numerous times, Adam Cole is like the modern personification of Shawn Michaels, and this felt like a Shawn Michaels move. Only like if Shawn Michaels did it, like you'd be wondering if it was a shoot because like. He came out and he's just like laying waste. He's like, I'm the fucking star. And then Karrion Cross comes out. He's like, yeah, motherfucker. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how tough you are. You couldn't fucking wrestle me on your fucking best day and my worst day. I'm the fucking best that's ever done this. Just that real fucking attitude. And they had like the cockiness to back it up, right? Like the, like Adam Cole's the real deal. Like I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Like Adam Cole's so good. And even though it led to, like, this five-way, which is kind of, like, meh, like, it sounds interesting. Like, I was really enjoying this three-way. 
But then, like, now I'm just like, fuck, Adam Cole just rules so much ass. He's great. Uh, I, I agree. I thought it was interesting that Adam Cole's promo on Carrying Cross kind of leaned into some shoot elements of why, you know, smarks like us aren't really the biggest fan of Carrying Cross's title reign is because he's not the NXT, you know, worker that we're used to, that we're used to holding the NXT title. And I thought it was smart that they leaned into that. And really, it just made me want to see Adam Cole versus Karrion Cross. <laughs> I'll be honest. I mean, I want to see all yeah. the... I, I, and the, the five-way... I, I, you know, we were initially down on the five-way. The last five-way we saw was Great Balls of Fire, and we were initially down on that, too. And that was... A, a killer match, and the talent in that five way is absolutely off the charts. Kyle O'Reilly, Pete Dunn, Johnny Gargano, Karrion Cross, and Adam Cole. I mean, that is some real fucking talent, and I trust them to make an interesting match. I trust them to make a good match. Whether it's a great match remains to be seen. But I'm not. The only bummer is like four of those guys will always be in NXT, and one of them is going to be going to the main roster. Like, that, you know what I mean? It's just, it, it kind of reinforces that aspect of, like, these are the top guys in NXT, and they're going to be in NXT. And I could see them taking this belt off Karrion Cross by not pinning him so Karrion can go to the main roster while these guys still just kind of exist in this um, kind of purgatory situation because, NXT is not presented as a third brain. It's presented as a developmental brain. That's fine. Mm. Like, that's completely fine. If they want to take Karrion Cross and take him up there and we get a couple more years of Pete Dunne versus Kyle O'Reilly versus Adam Cole versus Johnny Gargano versus Tommaso Ciampa, like, and they keep bringing guys in, I, that doesn't really strike me as a negative, to be honest, because Gargano was talked publicly about how Yo, I'm cool down here. He's like, I don't want to go anywhere else, and I don't. I, I mean, do you want to see Gargano on SmackDown? Of course not. No, I want to see Adam Cole um, main eventing pay per views though, um, and I want to see Pete Dunn because uh, he's young still, and for his age, I mean, he's fucking phenomenal. But very, like, very. He's young. Like, do we? Do we have to see 10 more years of Pete Dunne in NXT before he finally gets, like, a big paycheck? Like, fucking give this guy some fucking money, man. All right, so you're talking about the paycheck. I'm talking about as a fan. So, yes, I of course I want Pete Dunne to get paid, and I want Pete Dunne to be compensated for how good, you know, proportionally to how good I think that he is because, of course, I think that Pete Dunne's great. Um, I don't, you know, I – I honestly kind of hope that WWE just gets sold and that somebody gets in charge of NXT and is like, or somebody gets in charge of a couple other different divisions of WWE and it's like, hey, we're going to make this shit, you know, like the same way, like let's say that Disney buys WWE, right? Just completely hypothetically. Let's say Disney buys WWE. And then you have... You know, Roman Reigns and Jey Uso and uh, – uh, not Jey Uso, but Roman Reigns and all the top guys on the main – Drew McIntyre and shit. And they do the Rise of Skywalker, right? And then, so they do a lumberjack mech surrounded by Mandalorians. Well, oh, and, well I mean, and then you got the Mandalorian, which I've never watched, but by all accounts seems to be pretty good. Oh. Turn off the podcast and just fucking go watch it. No, I'm not no wait, I, I wait, wait, and fuck. then go watch. But I'm going to say that, like, you can have this stuff that's for the masses, and then you can have this stuff that's just incredible, which is basically what they're doing now, but NXT still has too much, a little bit too much main roster, and it's been that way since they've been on USA. Jason, what do you think? Okay. There's a lot of unpacking there. Um First things first, I thought the... We bring the content. Agreed. The match itself, I thought, was really good. It felt like more of a submission kind of match than just a, a normal triple threat match where you had guys trying to have other guys tap each other out, basically from the start to the finish. Adam Cole coming out, not a huge surprise because Kyle O'Reilly's there. The fact that he attacked 
Gargano and Pete Dunne really kind of set the tone for the promo after the fact. I thought he carried that promo. Uh, Karrion Cross, I think we talked about it two weeks ago. What is he? In this case, he morphed into somewhat of a baby face. Well, I mean, you say somewhat of a baby face when he was like, fuck it, give me all four of these jokers. That's the ultimate baby face move. That was an Oscar move back in the NXT he's, days. He's a baby face. Now he's a baby face. So in this scenario, I like the match. I liked Adam Cole coming out. I baby. didn't like the fact that it's now a fatal five way match versus just doing Kieran Cross versus Adam Cole, baby, and a singles match for the title. It just feels a, lot, a little convoluted for my taste, but you did bring up Great Balls of Fire. We did shit on it then, and it turned out to be way better than expected. This is NXT, so I'll give you that leeway, but the knee jerk reaction was like, this is way too many motherfuckers for one match. The truth is, if you're going to do a fatal five way, I'd rather see a tournament. I'd rather see two of those guys face two of those guys and one of those guys face, I, like, I would rather have it be two heels and two face. I would just rather have a tournament because it makes more matches more meaningful. And all you, you want. You can flip storylines from it. All, it just makes, all it you, makes sense. All you want, and this is what New Japan has right, is that when you're watching wrestling, you want you want the matches to mean something. Yeah, that's why, that's why Raw has been unwatchable for four years because the matches don't mean anything. Cedric Alexander lost to Shelton Benjamin in 28 seconds the other night. Yeah, that was. I didn't watch it. I just read. Dude, I watched it. it. I was pissed. <laughs> Wait, dude, what the fuck? Is um. This? So, Hit Row came out. They had another segment with Killian Dane and Drake Maverick, and more and more and more. Every time I see Hit Row, it's like. <laughs> I'm hopping on that hit road train, dude. Those guys, that that is a fun stable. Jason, what do you think? Hit road was good. Um, I thought Drake Maverick kind of jumping, you know, around Killian Dane trying to get a hit road was funny. Um, obviously, I think we're going to set up some sort of a a match with Hit Row and Drake Maverick and Killian Dane. I, d- I just like the hit row chemistry for whatever reason, even though I'm not a big top dollar guy, he kind of works into the chemistry of hit row. Ultimately it works. Um, I just can't see where I'm more excited for swerve than for anybody else, because I think swerve has kind of just been in like we, like we said a couple of times in that purgatory mid car purgatory. And now this might be a chance hit for him to break out swerve and swerve is hit row, dude. Pretty much. Uh, what do you think Zach? I'm just glad they're getting a push in May and June and not February because I know it's not just a token situation and we might actually see some real deal like movement with these guys because I think they're all very, very talented. Good point. Um, (laughs) This is just a side story. The guy that we got over here working on our basements, he's a black guy, and uh, he's cool. I like him a whole lot, and I came home the other day and I said – he goes, we had to turn off your electricity. The internet hasn't come back on. Uh, I called AT&T to try to get the internet back on. They said they'll work on it. He's like, you might want to try to call. And I was like, you think I should try to call and put on my best white voice I can? Hey, sir, can you come out here and uh, can you fix the internet? He's like, hey, you said it. I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, I can only do so much, Mr. Viggy? Uh, the hedge? The hedge? The hedge? Uh, I'm a big fan of Hit Row. Uh, LA Knight takes another loss to Jake Atlas. Uh, I kind of like what they're doing here with LA Knight. You know, it's kind of it's counterintuitive, which what... Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. It's counterintuitive to what you would think they would do with bringing in a guy with a lot of fanfare who cuts a bunch of promos. And he loses because Cameron Grimes, who I love, uh, kind of gets in the way. Jake Atlas gets a win. It's been a while since Jake Atlas got a, one that I, True a story. win that I can think of. Um, what do you think about the way they're treating L.A. Knight? Because I'm an L.A. Knight slash Eli Drake fan, it's kind of disappointing. I, I can see where your perspective is on this. 
Um, they can't. T- you can't tell the same story with every guy. That no, comes no, no, no. Room. Like I said, I I totally see your perspective. That's why I can't jump on it the way I want to. I'll just say this. You said how WWE main roster infiltrates NXT. The distraction finish is a main roster crutch. That is like, you know, their mood to finish a match. And I'm watching this match, and it was cool up until where Cameron Grimes came out. And once Cameron Grimes came out, I was like, oh, shit, okay, the distraction is coming out. How is it going to happen? And that's what kind of takes away for me, at least for the match itself. The angle I don't have a, a much of a problem with, you know, especially if you're going to bring back the million dollar title or bring, you know, pass on the million dollar legacy. Okay, that I'm a cool with that focus. The match itself was good up until Cameron Grimes came out. Two beer. I don't have any strong feelings about LA Knight. Um, I'm just really. Well, you uh, shouldn't. They haven't given you a reason to. I mean, yeah, honestly, and I mean, they like, I, I liked him on, I liked him on NWA. That was actually my introduction to him because I didn't see him like impact and stuff. So I liked him in NWA. I thought he was like a, uh, he was like one of my favorite parts of the show because mm. that was a very promo heavy show, and obviously that's where he's got the most chops. Uh, but uh, yeah, like uh, you know, Cameron Grimes versus LA Knight in a ladder match for custody of Ted DiBiase. Sure. Okay. Kush- okay. Yeah. Kush- it's, it's, he should book the territory. That's good enough for me. Uh, Kushida versus Carmelo Hayes. Kushida gets a an enhancement win. Um, I like Carmelo Hayes. I know you do. I know you, you like all the guys. He actually he looked he looked real good. Oh, oh, oh you know, amongst the obvious reasons why I like Carmelo Hayes. But like, <laughs> um, I, I've never seen him before. Um, yeah, I was going like, to say can, that I can remember. Um, and I mean, I know he's in there with Kushida, but Kushida wasn't the reason this match was good. He looked real good. No, they said his, like his former name. And then, you know, he's now Carmelo Hayes. So, I mean, it feels like this is someone indie related that I'm sure that in some form or fashion, if we sat down and thought about it, we've seen him somewhere before, but no, to me, Kushida winning, obviously, you know, in this scenario should be happening. But the takeaway for me was Carmelo Hayes. He looked really good, you know, keeping up with Kushida. And I think that's, you know, a good reason to have these open challenges. It's not for looking for the title changes to get guys over. We had The Way, uh, Candice LeRae, and Indy Hartwell defeated uh, Zoe Stark and Zeta. uh, Rainier? Yeah, Rainier. Um, Ramir. Ramir. It's an M. Yeah, Ramir. You said it, man. No, I know. I'm correct about myself. Um, <laughs> I think it's an N, and I'll spend the next five minutes arguing about it. It's M. It's M as in Max. Oh, I told you it's been Z- five minutes. Zach, okay. Jet, Zach just wants to say the N word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then in the main event, and this was pretty disappointing to me. We had Shooting a- star oppression. <laughs> <laughs> This was pretty disappointing to me. At the end, we had a uh, a very a very AEW finish. It was a schmaz to end all schmazes in in, in NXT. We usually don't get this. MSK uh, versus Legado del Fantasma. Uh, Champa and Thatcher come out. Uh, our first of all, Grizzly Young Veterans come out. Yeah, I was going to say, and then. Champa and Thatcher come out, and then Bronson Reed comes out to put down Santos. It was a big time schmoz. I wouldn't say it was a. It wasn't as bad as. Okay, the way you're you're explaining it, it it wasn't as bad as AEW. The way you're explaining it is if you didn't watch it, this all happened at once. It's literally the beginning of the match and at the end of the match. GYV came out. Champ and Thatcher snatched him up. That's like in the first few minutes of the match. Bronson Reed doesn't come out until Santos Escobar gets involved, and then that's when Bronson Reed comes out. It's not like you have 15 guys coming out there fighting for no reason because, you know, Adam Page is out there. You know, there was, you know, they at least connected the dots of why Champa and Thatcher came out. Why Bronson Reed came out. Yep. So, I mean, I get where you're going with it, but it, it's. It's not nearly as bad as you make it seem to be. I can't believe you fell for that trap. That's exactly right. It's not as bad as it seems to be. Because AEW does this shit all the time. What do you think, Zach? 
I actually didn't even notice it was a, a big thing because uh, as like many like criticisms that I have of like the, the NXT show and stuff, like this is not one of them. It's a criticism that I have of AEW. So when it happened on here, it didn't seem um, overdone or overwhelming because this is not something that they are guilty of doing a lot. So, so you give them a pass. Yeah, and I mean, like, if it was like, uh, like Tony Soprano you know, giving giving uh, Tony Soprano will give Jackie Junior a pass, but Ralph has to make a decision. So. <laughs> God, I miss the Sopranos. No, I'm not going to give it a pass. I'm just saying it's not as ba- what I say. It's not as bad as it seems. It's you can have misdemeanors, you can have felonies. It's still a crime. It's how bad the crime is. When is that pay per view? Oh, they said it was like two in two weeks. No, it's like it's less than two weeks. It's like next Sunday. It's like the the thirteenth, and it's an actual pay per view. It is not. On, it's a it's an NXT yeah, it's a, takeover, takeover on in your, Peacock. Yeah, in your house. All right, cool. That's in good. your house, hosted by Todd Pettengill. Good lord, God, I'm getting old. That's gonna do it for our three count. <laughs> One, God two, damn. Three. All right, odds and ends. Uh, we have New Japan. Uh, Jason, tell us what we need to know about New Japan. Hello, obviously. We got um, Dominion coming up. Dominion's coming up on Saturday slash Sunday, depending on where you live. Um, the main event was essentially set, I guess that was Monday, with the first round of shows coming out. It will be Okada versus Shingo for the vacant IWGP heavyweight title. Um, I know we've thrown around some ideas of how we thought they would possibly uh, fill that title. To me, this is it's simple. It makes sense. Shingo was the guy that was going to have his shot. Okada was the guy on deck. With no wool off spray, you just put these two guys together in the ring, put the title on the line, roll the ball out, and make it happen. That's For me, that's the great part about New Japan, is that in a situation Shingo like... Shingo Okada. It's Shingo Okada. Uh, like for I said, the vacant belt. For the vacant belt. Um like I said, for me, I don't have a problem with that because they've at least built a – I just talked about connect the dots. They connected the dots at least a couple times beforehand where this is not just so out of right field that it doesn't make sense. We have some sort of, you know, build to this. Okada's got a, you know, a win on the Shingo. Shingo got the big win on Okada at uh, the first round of New Japan Cup. So, you know, we got a little, at least a little bit of a, a rivalry going on. I won't call it a feud just yet, but we got a rivalry going on. From there, um, Koto Ibushi and Jeff Cobb will have a uh, a match against each other. I, I think this might be one of those matches like a Stone Cold Rock or Rock versus Austin. There's no title on the line, but it, it could steal the show. And then uh, you would have Yo versus Despy for the Junior Heavyweight Championship Um I'm not really expecting Yo to win this. We've kind of done this the first time. Obviously, we're running it back. I think this is just to kind of extend the the Despy run until we can get Ishimori, ELP, and Hiromu back into the mix, and then we can get the best of the Super Juniors going, and now you can get the Junior Heavyweight uh, division going. Go ahead, Two Beer. I'm, I'm done talking on this one. <laughs> uh, I could see Yo taking it off Despy. You really uh, think so? From- just from all accounts, Despy was real sick. He was one of the guys that actually was the sickest when it came down to the COVID outbreak. So really? I don't know necessarily, like, how he is. Obviously, he's better if he's wrestling, but they might, you know, do a little transition there uh, for that and give him a little baby face win. Because uh, Yo is um, not only a talent, but he's, like, also, like, ultimate baby face, like, dude. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, like... Uh, like you said, with Shingo and Okada, it's kind of like making the best out of a terrible situation. Mm-hmm. Dude, dude, like, I could have unsubscribed from New Japan for, like, the last, like, two months, really, based on how much I've watched it. And it's not their fault. Uh, they're just really suffering. And I, you know, part of it's me being very busy, but also part of it's just, like, them having to throw, uh, you know, audibles and stuff because they've got all this shit going on. But, Okada, Shingo, I mean, these have been some of the best matches that we've ever seen, like, in our collective lives. And them doing it on a big stage like Dominion, they are not going to hold back. And like you said, with with Cobb and Abushi, I think on another card where it's not Shingo Okada, it could be matched tonight. 
which means it's going to be awesome. But dude, I'm so looking forward to Shingo Okada so much that even though, like I said, I've kind of not used the subscription, like I'm staying up. Like I don't give up. Yeah, I was going to say it's like I'm watching it live. Yeah, I'm, gonna I'm coming straight high. home, getting the pizza, yeah, getting the Red Bull, get something to eat, and we're going to watch this Joker unfold. Watch Singo sell that fucking money clip like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> he better not pass out to that money clip. I swear to God. Uh, no, I agree I mean, with you. I'm, I'm excited, just like you guys. I just, I just like to sleep. No, dude. Like I said, you guys I, ever slept? He's like before? that. He's it like that Shaq. He's like that Shaq. He's like that Shaq meme. It's like New Japan World Live. Like I sleep, and then <laughs> <laughs> he's like next morning. I wake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that if I wake up too late, somebody's going to spoil it. So, I mean, for me, especially because I There's still work those late hours. It, man. Yeah. There's something special. I don't do it every show, but like a Dominion, a Wrestle Kingdom, this I'm done. Yeah, it. if it's a one-shot deal where I, I could stay up late enough, it's fine. I mean, I don't have to work Saturday night if it goes into Sunday or Sunday if it goes into Monday. I'll have to work either day. The next day, so yeah, a little deprived sleep can be made up the next day by no stretch of imagination. I'm not worried about that. Um, we also had oh well, we had the Dangerous Techers versus God. Uh, Jason, what you think about it? I, I I'm a little just disappointed, I guess, because it just kind of goes back to the lack of the overall depth in. The tag division, I shouldn't say obviously, Dangerous Techers won back the the titles over uh, G.O.D. It was a good match, but I guess ultimately it kind of just goes back to where now it's it's now what? What do we do with these tag titles? With this partnership that you have, it sounded like a really good idea, but now with travel restrictions, with go- what's going on COVID-wise in, in Japan, this tag division that I thought they could get better, that you could bring guys in and make this thing work, is is probably going to be suffering the most. The match itself, I thought it was good. You know, Dangerous Tackers and G.O.D. have good chemistry. Just looking forward, I think there is the problem in, in the hand because you just don't have much going on. I don't even think you have enough teams to do World Tag League at this point, much less, you know, worrying about a tag division itself. Not with the, not with the travel restrictions. You know what I'm saying? So, in that scenario... It, Which, I mean, not a big loss. I mean, World Tag League is... Like, there's some, like, Jim Diamonds in the rough, but, man, like, that's a fucking slog of a tournament. To yeah, that was going to say, I don't even think I watched it last year, to be perfectly honest. Um, I really don't want to talk about Raw at all. It was... Uh, we talked about it last week. It was the same show. It's cool. We, are, we already talked about it. Okay. Um, it ain't too much far from the Drew. Well... Drew won, so you got Drew and Lashley... No problem with that. You got Drew and Lashley and Hell in the Cell. I shouldn't say no problem with that, but uh, I tell you what, I did watch the Drew Kofi match and like that was really again, good. Again, Drew McIntyre just goes out there and he's like, "I'll be fucking goddamn if I'm going to be on the worst wrestling show of the week." And he's like, "I'm going to fucking make this work." That's and true. like, I mean, Kofi went out there and had like a 20 minute match. It was awesome. I thought um, the new announcer was good. So did Adnan Burke get fired? They mutually. I think he quit. They mutually decided to part ways. Is with the way I, Man, I heard it worked. Did not take very long at Five all. Five weeks, six weeks. Fuck! I heard him on a podcast. Like he was all pumped up to do it. That did not take very long. The new guy's name is Jimmy Smith. Jimmy Smith. Yeah, he does a uh, a serious XM show on MMA. I think he was on NYPD Blue. <laughs> no, diff- different. Uh, that's Jimmy Smith. That was Dennis Frank. <laughs> <laughs> No, God, damn, uh, they should have Dennis Frank on there. That'd be fucking great. I thought he did all, all bullshit aside. I thought he Sipowitz did really well. Sipowitz does it. Sipowitz does it. Um, yeah, there's not much else. I think we covered it all, guys. We got some birthdays this week, though. People celebrated their birthdays. Did they? They did. How dare they? Gorilla Monsoon would have been 84. RIP. Uh, Riho is 24. It's a good, it's such a good match with uh, Serena Deeb. That's the one thing we didn't talk about. Serena Deeb and Rio had a really good match in the buy-in. Ahmed, Ahmed Johnson, 51. Uh, superstar Billy Graham. R.I.P. Would have been 78. Howard Finkel, the Fink. R.I.P. Would have been oh, s- major R.I.P. What a fucking dude. Yeah. Arguably the greatest ring announcer of all time. Would have been 71. Uh, yeah, he was awesome. 
Uh, Liv Morgan is 27. Tatanka. Surprised she didn't get cut. Tatanka. Still alive? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're looking at me. I'm, <laughs> I went in the RFP or not. Uh, I think he's still alive. Tatanka's 56, and so is Mick Foley. That sounds strange, right? Yeah. Do you think that's wrong on the internet? You no, think I the internet think. Was wrong? No, the internet's never wrong, but I mean, I guess, you know, looking at the two careers, that's they're being a, the same age. So Mick Foley's 56. Um, Tay hmm. Conte is 26. I still uh, got a chance. Dude Love is 56. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Dan Severn is 63. Uh, Cactus Jack is 56. Shut up. Are you serious? Nice. Yeah. Nice. Drew McIntyre is 36. And last but not least, Mankind is 56. Dude, there's a lot of guys on 50, put, that, that, 56 this turning this week. That's weird. I know. It's pretty weird. Hey, everybody. We know there's tons of podcasts to listen to, so we appreciate you guys listening to our podcast. For Vice. Check. For Tinder Hall. For check. Murray the Man Murray. Check. For Lucha Chris. Check. For Two Beers, Zach Pullman. Double check. For Jason Cornelius Bell. I am bitches. Bill Vagy, a.k.a. Double check. Avon Smarksdale. I started rewatching The Wire, which is, I was like, ooh, that's good. Uh, hey, everybody, support your local weed, deal- weed dealers. Check. Support your local restaurants. Double check. Black Lives Matter. Triple check. And just boo the heels. Boo!